Hi, I'm Cynthia Ng and you are watching Vantage Point. This episode, we are recording from the sidelines of the International Conference to highlight on the plight of the Rohingyas. Now, for decades, the Rohingyas have been subjected to severe discrimination and persecution. This Muslim minority community, they live in the Arakan region in Western Myanmar and they are not recognized as citizens, they have no rights, they can't work, they have no access to education or healthcare. Basically, they are refugees in their own country and they are mostly living in absolute poverty. And recently, in June, violence erupted in this region and forcing hundreds of thousands of Rohingyas to flee for safety and most of them have gone to neighboring country, Bangladesh, Thailand and even so in Malaysia. Now, we are not keeping silent about this, so here we are today to talk about this issue and have two guests who are Brumis themselves. I'm very happy for you guys to be here. Firstly, I'd like to introduce the person next to me is Mr. Nurul Islam. He's the president of the Arakan Rohingya National Organization based in London. And next to him, we have Dr. Zani. He is a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. Thank you so much for being on the show. Now, if I may just want to go to the uh, recent happening, the violence that erupted in June. What exactly happened and why is it that Rohingyas so severely persecuted in Myanmar? Perhaps, uh, Dr. Zani, you could take that question. The, the official narrative is that uh, a Rakhine Buddhist woman was raped and brutally murdered by a group of three Muslim men out of hatred yeah, uh, towards the uh, Rakhine local community. But the recent uh, research done by my colleagues in the country, in the region, they have discovered um, several major contradictions and actually um, uh, untruths about this case. First of all, the Burmese medical superintendent who signed uh, under duress the post-mortem report of this Burmese or Rakhine woman stated unequivocally that she was murdered, she was looted, her ears were cut off, uh, mm -hmm. you know, earrings and all the, you know, uh, all the jewelry is gone, but she was not raped at all. He said there was no trace through his medical examination of her body of her having been raped before she was murdered. So, and the question then is, why right. is the Burmese state media controlled by the Burmese generals repeatedly reported that this was a, 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 a heinous rape crime. crime. Okay. Yeah. And secondly, one of, the, uh, one of the three men that were charged with raping and murdering this woman turned out to be a Burmese Buddhist person. Then the question is, why is the Burmese state media uh, presenting the story as if it were Muslim men, you know, raping out of hatred and prejudice against Buddhist community of Rakhine people. And most importantly, and thirdly, the Burmese Buddhist man uh, was found dead in police custody. And the, the state media conveniently declared he committed suicide in police custody. And Burmese jails are not known for inmates taking their own lives, but not known for inmates being tortured to death it, during interrogations. And so these are like, these are major, major facts because they are the pillars of this official narrative that, you know, the hate motivated these three Muslim men to rape and brutally murder a Rakhine Buddhist woman. And well, the fact was, they're not entirely Muslim, and she was not raped. Okay. And then why does the Burmese state keep repeating this narrative that became the trigger of racial violence? Why is there so much hatred towards this community, this minority community? Because we see that the violence that was inflicted, it's, it's a communal uh, violence between the Muslims and Buddhists, is being overplayed that this is the issue, but we see that the state are supporting the attacks as well. Do you see this as ethnic cleansing? Yeah, this is actually what happened. You know, this is a systematic racism against the uh, Muslim community. If you look at the uh, Rohingya history, then you have first to see it minus Burma. 
first. You have to look at minus bed. That means before the occupation of uh, Arakan by the Burmese, you have to know 1784. Then you can see what is the what was the actual position of the Muslim community in, in Arakan. Uh, you, they were the really rulers. They were the uh, they, they have got glorious um, the, he, past in Arakan as a, as, as a traders, as a farmers, as a fishermen, uh, as a statesmen, as a rulers, as a kingmakers. You will see that. Right? Then even then, now the question now is they are, they, are, they are saying we are illegal immigrants. This is a completely unfounded thing. Even before the Bar occupation of Burma by the Burmen, there was a Muslim society, Muslim settlement that it cannot be overruled, it cannot be denied. Now this is completely what happened, the, the way they are now, I mean, the, uh, uh, making propaganda against the Rohingya and the Muslim people, this is just a racism, just to make a clean sweep of the Muslim from Araka. This is ethnic cleansing, you said, as you said. From the Burmese government, what do they gain? Because we see like they are undergoing huge reforms politically, they are opening up their, their trade, economic liberalization that's happening. Why no, raise the, the condemnation I, by the international community by not solving this issue? Why is that, why is the Rohingyas not accepted as citizens? Uh, we, we, if you look uh, back to uh, Burmese history, what happened? These uh, Burmese, I mean the uh, ruler and their stalwarts, they are, throughout the history, they are pursuing a policy of Burmanization. Uh, it's a Burmanization. That means uh, it's a true assimilation. So even they want to put uh, everyone in the Burmese melting pot and uh, assimilate the people. So in the case of Arakan, what happened? Uh, you see some point in Arakan, we have a uh, historical and the geopolitical and the and big religious bigotry. All these three points very important. As to historical mean, Arkan was never a part of Burma until uh, uh, Burmese occupation in 1784. Mm -hmm. it, it stood as an independent country. Okay. Moreover, geographically, it was uh, very much uh, not uh, very easy to co communication with Burma. It has all the time relationship uh, with the Muslim Bengal, in fact, in the, in the field of culture, civilization, and uh, even the religion, it's trade. So even, even Burman tried to occupy Arakan attack Arakan many times before be, before seven nine, seven eight to four. Even whenever the Burma attack Arakan, our kings and nobles and the, they try they, they they used to take shelter in Bengal. Bengal had never territorial ambition of Arakan. Okay. And what Bengal did, Bengal helped them and real estate them in the India in the India in 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 India places, in the kingdom. And it creates a sort of resentment. Among. Reasonment, that's right. So this is a historical, ge geographic, geopolitical, geographical, this is the position is that Arkan and Burma is quite separated by the long range of the range of Arkan mountain range. Uh, this is an near impossible, this is a to uh, Arkan and Burma communication. So this is a, uh, so when you are going to, to impose the Burmanization, to practice Burmanization, so you, uh, this is uh, in the case of Arakan. Uh, this is not, uh, I mean, the uh, applicable on the Rohingya people. They are not going to accept it. Mm -hmm. So when they are not going to accept this, they don't feel secure because they want to make it a Muslim free region. That question is, yeah. and the, this is this is what they are going to do. So this is the main thing, yeah. and 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 the, and the history and uh, this is this is the thing actually. This is the, the thing. The Burmese government's need, strategic need to mobilize the domestic public support vis-a-vis uh, -vis Aung San Suu Kyi and her rising domestic and international po popularity. The, the, viol the, co the communal or the so-called communal violence came on the, you know, on the eve of Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, trip to Europe. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of her rising popularity, you know, she went to uh, World Economic Forum in uh, uh, late May or early June in Bangkok, and President Thane Sein cancelled his um, participation at the World Economic Forum because she, he felt uh, 
that he will be upstaged by Aung San Suu Kyi, and and, and rightly so. Yeah? And then so I think that the Burmese government resorted to mobilizing uh, basically popular Burmese racism towards the Rohingya in particular and towards Islam in so general. So it begs the question, the prejudice appears to be a common view not just shared by the military but also the majority of Burmese people as well. Is this an indication that it means that even so there is progress in democracy, the situation in Rohingya will never change. So what is the solution? I have to take this com uh, discussion to the first commercial break. We'll be back shortly and we'll have Dr. Zani to answer that question. Stay with us. Islam Hingga Sabtu Ini sebuah kota. Dalam kota ini semuanya selamat. Tetapi ada yang mahukan lebih daripada kandungan kota ini. Fikir di luar kota, cabar normal dan pemikiran bisnes biasa. Rancangan ini padat dengan idea segar menungkah arus konvensional. Pusing-pusing kata dunia boleh jadi terbaik. Oh, style you nak, 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 kan? Business Alternative. Isnin hingga Sabtu, 11.30 malam di Astro Awani. Berita segenap dimensi. Hi, you're still on Vantage Point and we are talking about the plight of the Rohingyas. Earlier, Dr. Zani, we mentioned about the prejudice against Rohingyas and shared not just by the military the gov or the government, but majority of Burmese as well. Why is that so? Well, one is the um, prejudices are generally the outcome of a society that is prevented to evolve naturally. Because, you know, all societies uh, started out with this in-group and outside group mentality you know that's like uh, racism and but most societies that have like semi-open or fully open um, political systems um, the people intermingle people receive information correct information instead of like relying on rumors and then in other words societies are evolving when political systems are open so racism you know, get subject to different views and they get challenged. But in, in the case of Burma, this is a country that has been closed off from the world for mm -hmm. 50 years. You know, when other societies are undergoing changes in their racial view, racial attitude, prejudices. And so, so racism in Burma remains widespread and potent. And the military uh, is also made up of racist generals themselves. The ra uh, the, you know, the, they genuinely believe in the superiority of Burmese Buddhists uh, over the rest of the uh, other communities. And so this is the, this is the most disturbing case of uh, extremely illiberal political leadership you know, merging with the popular racist majority. That's why I think you know, even people like Aung San Suu Kyi, who's, you know, who's yes. widely regarded as... She has kept as, silent over she this has, issue. She has not taken an unequivocal and principled you know, pro-human rights stance when it comes to Rohingya issue. And, and there are also like a younger generation Burmese dissident leaders from 1988 student uprising, as well as the older generation of uh, Burmese political dissidents, such as uh, Uwen Tin, who was who is co-founder of the National League for Democracy, they, you know, all these uh, dissidents have, in general, uh, ganged up on the Rohingya and say um, they they are not part of Burma. They cannot be, you know, granted um, basically uh, the um, the human rights. So this is coming from the dissidents. So so forget the Burmese generals and how they would treat this um, population. The Rohingya problem as a whole. It is, uh, uh, this is uh, ethnic, religious, and political persecution. And uh, uh, this is a long-standing problem. It's a more than, I mean, the uh, 60, uh, six decades, the more than six decades now. So the problem must be f resolved first and foremost within the country. This is very important. It must be resolved internally. Internally. This is, a, this is very important because, you see, these people should be able to live peacefully and honorably with all human dignity and rights with, within their own country, in their homeland. This, this is very important. So for the, and this reflects 
the customary international law because the 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 the, the natural home the natural place of an individual is his homeland so they should be able to do with there so for these they should be able what their rights and freedom must be ensured yeah, on par with other ethnic groups of the country this is very important point Rohingya should be able to live peacefully in their own homeland. Their rights and privileges must be guaranteed by constitution on par with other ethnic groups. How would you see international pressure work in addressing this? Do yeah, you now you look at uh, now see the recent violence. Uh, you see the, as you told right now, the president has disowned our people already. He said the United Nations, the, you take these people, take care of them, and then until third countries has uh, some third countries come for, for so resettlement. They are really so that determined that say I don't yeah. want these people here. Yeah. So if your own yeah. Yeah. mother don't want the, your the child, so where else what? can the person go? It, it, it affirms it affirms that uh, Rohingya has no domestic uh, I mean the protection. No national protection. See so we in the absence of national protection, the responsibility to protect these people we on the international community. But we are at a time where all countries seem to want to get along with Myanmar because it's strategic and you see EU has dropped the sanctions, US is deepening diplomatic ties with Myanmar. This seems to be a time to just stay silent. What do you think? Yes, I mean, it, if you look at the uh, Western government's responses, you know, um, the government's responses have been rather meek and mild. And it took uh, nearly two months for London and Washington to come out publicly saying this is not okay. What the, Bur the Burmese government is doing is not okay. It's not just a sectarian violence in the sense of two communities attacking each other. The government troops were directly involved in slaughtering of Rohingya people. Yeah? So, so you've got the Burmese government is not there as a lawgiver, protector of communities. They are there party to the Rakhines. And in, from, from my uh, own research, I see this as the Burmese government initially outsourcing violence you know, to the, the Rakhines, targeting and scapegoating the Rohingya population. I mean, there is a, um, a rather callous political calculation on the part of the Burmese generals. Just about five years ago, in 2007, the Burmese military government was widely reviled by the domestic population, as well as condemned by the international community. Firstly, you know, uh, for the fact that they were slaughtering Buddhist monks and raiding thousands of Buddhist monasteries across the country. There are thousands of monks that were arrested you know, by, the, by, the, uh, by the military. Now, they, they earn the reputation as monk killers. That's in the eyes of the Burmese Buddhists, the generals are monk killers. They will never be forgiven. But yeah? things have changed a little. And now, they, the Burmese government has refashioned itself as protector of Buddhist faith and protector of uh, Buddhist communities in Rakhine state. So that's why we are seeing, you know, mass rallies in you know the heartlands of Burma such as my own hometown Mendeley thousands of monks and local people Buddhist communities joining hand um, you know with um, pr uh, basically rallying in support of President Thein Sein and say President Thein Sein we are fully behind you we must expel these you know non-Buddhist people we don't want them see in five years time they have been able to refashion themselves from monk killing sure. regime to defenders of Buddhist faith and protector of Buddhist communities. This is an extremely brilliant political stra strategy that has been pursued at the expense of one million Rohingya people. So you're saying that the people, of the Burmese people, are in support of government to get rid of the Rohingyas exactly, from their country? Exactly. Okay, so that leaves the question, what can we do as international community? Let's take a look after the break on the ASEAN because Myanmar will be chairing ASEAN in 2014. And let's look at how nation states across this region can help play a role in maybe finding a solution to the plight of the Rohingya. Stay with us, we'll come back shortly.
We're starting. Starting? One word to sum up relay. Amazing. Very humbling. Exciting. Fun. Community. Community. Fantastic. It's a dream come true. Emotional. Relay for Life Malaysia is a 16-hour event. So as long as you have one person walking around at any one point, it's cool. It's great to come back year after year, meeting friends, celebrating life. It's a great family day out. You can walk, you can run, you can meet up with your friends. And best of all, you can raise money for the National Cancer Society of Malaysia. I raised 8,000 ringgit. It was fun. At the end of the day, we're here to support the National Cancer Society of Malaysia. Hi, you're still watching Vantage Point and we are on the topic on the plight of Dr. Huinas. Now, Dr. Zani, we, I mentioned earlier that um, Myanmar will be chairing the ASEAN state in 2014. And we see that ASEAN has always practiced a non-interference policy when it comes to domestic affairs. Do you see that there will be a change this time around in regards to the issues of, uh, faced by the Rohingyas? Hey, well, you see, uh, ASEAN, Obama is a member of the ASEAN in 1997. Uh, under the RCN Charter, Burma is committed to uh, values of uh, peace, democracy, and promotion of human rights, you see. And also, RCN has a duty, responsibility for the promotion of, I mean, the uh, human rights and protection of the RCN people. So, uh, in the case of Rohingya, uh, being part of Burma, they, are, they should be looked at as ASEAN people. Rohingyas are ASEAN people. So the Russian government, ASEAN member state, has an obligation to protect Rohingya rights in, our, in, 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 uh, in, in Burma. Uh, and moreover, the Rohingya problem is not a domestic uh, problem of Burma. Particularly it's, uh, with, the, with the refugee and the yes. boat people problem, it affects the whole region. And uh, this is a, it's a, it becomes a, a regional problem, and it warrants a regional solution, regional solution. This is ASEAN uh, has a very important role to play in this question. Dr. Zani. The issue is, has a regional and international dimensions, because Rohingya <coughs> refugees flee as far as you know, Canada, uh, okay. Australia, so it's not just ASEAN. And so that means that, you know, like a government, and, you know, um, Canada, US, UK, Australia, they need to be part of that solution. And so what sort of institutional follow-up or mechanisms should be put in place? Well, I mean, there should be an international uh, working group to help resolve the, uh, uh, the Rohingya issue because the Burmese <coughs> government um, you know, has shown time and again, as soon as the, you know, the international media focus has moved away from Burma and onto other you know, crises, uh, then like, you know, it it, it goes back to business as usual. And so uh, like in order for that um, not to happen, there has to be a, a formation of a working group within ASEAN and outside of ASEAN to monitor the situation, to monitor the treatment of these people until such a time as these um, you know, Rohingya people are granted full citizenship with all ethnic and the political rights that you know are on a par with um, other ethnic groups. Do you see that there is any light to the end of the tunnel from the Yeah, this is a, it's a, it's a very long-standing problem. It needs a um, uh, uh, solution. When you are going to uh, look for the solution, the main, I mean, the core of the problem um, uh, should be dealt with, as strongly dealt with. And then the, I mean, the marginalization they are, I mean, the uh, uh, refugees and the statelessness and the respect for the human rights and respect for the religion and different and all these three and, the, and all these three are to be dealt with effectively. Yeah. So this is a very important point. When you are going to look uh, to solve this problem, you have to look this uh, to root cause of the problem. And and the Bangladesh, green and neighboring country, and also 
it, is, uh, it has to be at the brunt of the refugee problem in the first uh, country of our Rohingya asylum. It needs, also, it needs also to play a very I mean, important role. And more all, the, all those countries who are affected in the region by the Rohingya and the both people and the refugee problem, they should also be and they come uh, support this issue. Yeah. And this should be, uh, uh, in, uh, we have to involve the organization of Islamic cooperation mm -hmm. because they, it has, as if it, uh, it, has, it, it, it is a, it is a mandate. It is mandated by the Muslim countries to uh, protect the Muslim minority in non-Muslim countries. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like ASEAN itself um, has this ASEAN Human Rights Charter, and I think uh, this is the litmus test for ASEAN to see if, like, a regional crisis such as you know the uh, the violation of systematic violation of human rights of Rohingya people. Yeah? can be seen as an opportunity to basically you know, walk the walk of human rights for ASEAN, not just talk the talk. Mm -hmm. And then you know, what happens at, at, the, uh, at the bottom line? The bottom line is the Burmese government is systematically dehumanizing uh, a massive population of Rohingya people just you know, on the grounds of their ethnicity mm -hmm. and, and the secondarily religion. And so I think this is the case where ASEAN should pursue fully uh, its commitment to making human rights part of its ASEAN value. Well, it does not seem that there will be an instant overnight solution to the problem of Rohingyas, but I think what is important is to keep that public discourse, the pressure alive on the international agenda. And precisely why we are here today on the, uh, the International Conference for the uh, plight of the Rohingyas, and therefore I'd like to thank the Perdana Global Peace Foundation for organizing this event. I also want to thank my, both my speakers, Do uh, Mr. Islam and Dr. Zani, for being here. And if you have any questions or queries, please get us, uh, email me at cynthia underscore at astro.com.my, or you can go on Twitter and Facebook at Astro Awani. That's all the time that we have today for Vantage Point. We'll see you again. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Islam.